You're listening to the Tells the Leadership podcast. This podcast is for leaders at any phase on their leadership journey to become a more purposeful and accountable leader, what I like to call a pal. Join me on our journey together towards transformational leadership. Welcome back to Tells the Leadership. I am your host, Josh McMillian, an active duty Army officer and the founder of McMillian Leadership Coaching. And I am on a mission to create a better leader, what I like to call a purposeful, accountable leader or a pal. And my vision is to end toxic transitional leadership by promoting transformational stories and skills. And I have the honor to introduce you to a leader that I've known for a long time, Cheryl Lawson Wright. Cheryl is a dedicated community volunteer, educator, and mentor, and is committed to equity, fairness, and justice, and promotes a toxic-free lifestyle encompassing both mind, body, and spirit alignment. She is also a 12-year breast cancer survivor. Her passion lies in comforting cancer survivors and serving those within our community that are the most vulnerable. She's also the co-founder and established Real Hope for Help Incorporated and champions mental health and wellness. With her recent book that she just wrote, Jewels of My Journey, Cheryl showcases her creativity and inspiration as a writer, utilizing the power of words to overcome obstacles and thrive confidently and peacefully. I'm really excited for this episode. Let's go ahead and bring her on. Cheryl is a purposeful, accountable leader. Cheryl, welcome to the Tales of Leadership podcast. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you doing today, Josh? I I can't complain. Uh, Today has been a blessing. This is my second podcast episode, so I get to do one of the things that I'm passionate about, talk about leadership, and also get to reconnect with someone that I haven't got a chance to talk to for a very, very, very long time. Most of the people that I have on this show really don't have any type of connection to pre-existing to interviewing. But with you, I I feel like I know you because I've got to hear your story and the leader that you are. And I'm excited to bring that and illuminate that to the world. And thank you for this opportunity to be here. And I, I, it, feels like I know you well too, like we're family. Yeah. Yeah. So I think a great place to start and I always start off in the same is just provide an overview uh, to our listeners is uh, who is Cheryl? Okay. Cheryl is a thriver who has overcome many traumas in life. Um, starting as a little girl and I now know, you know, God didn't cause those things to happen, but he allowed me to endure those things so I can now help teach and and, and encourage and inspire and help others understand that although you may go through hardships in life, although you may experience trauma in life, but that does not define who you are and it does not stop you from becoming great and doing great things. So I've taken that trauma, childhood trauma, and I've allowed it to help me encourage others to be great and to overcome that that um, those things in life. I have to find that quote, and I, I don't know where it is. I think it's Second Corinthians. I was trying to look it up, but I, God can't. God will not give you more than you cannot handle or bear. Don't, you don't not hold me to it. Yeah. yeah, that that basically sums all of that up. Mm-hmm. And I think that really is defined within the stories that you've had to go through. Yes. But I would love before we get started, and I love being able to ask this question to everyone that from different backgrounds, but how do you define leadership? And how has that mat- changed as you've matured over the years? I define leadership and, and it's kind of I've evolved. And I've been able to perfect um, what I've always considered a leader. And it's it's ironic. It's kind of strange. Even as a child, I considered and thought a leader should be someone that served others, mm. not to be served. Although I, you know, we've experienced and seen throughout life that so many leaders look to be served. 
So I believe in leader, being a great leader is knowing how to serve others. That if you can't uh, put the needs of others before yours, then I think you struggle at being a great leader, a good, a real leader. So being a leader is, is being a servant. I love that definition. And I always break it. I call it TNT. I think, you know, me at this point, I'm, a whiz at creating acronyms for yes. about mm -hmm. everything, mm -hmm. but a toxic leader versus a transformational leader, toxic leaders have them at the agenda. They, they are the agenda. How can individuals right. on my team serve me, advance me so I can move to that next level versus transformational leaders have that servant heart. And they always ask the question first is how can I serve other people or how can I add value to other people? And I could not agree more with you yeah. of that. that one is thing that I also have, um, I, I believe leadership is about being more. I have this presentation that I do that's um, named entitled the lost art of relationships. Mm -hmm. And it speaks about, it teaches about learning to be more relational opposed to transactional. So in, in being relational, you're, you're going to look to, to um, know those individuals that you're lead, leading. You're going to see you know, who they are, um, what their needs are, and find their, you know, you know look, not just focus on their weaknesses and criticize those. You, know, you already know their strengths, but when you see those weaknesses that they may have, then you're going to figure out how to transform those weakness, help them transform those weaknesses to become a strength. So mm -hmm. you can't do that if you just have that personal agenda where you're just looking to get to the end result and make things happen. You know, you have to be relational, establish that relationship opposed to just making that transaction. Yeah, I think re relationships within the realm of, of leadership. It doesn't matter what career field that you're in. That is one of the hardest things I think to develop, but the most critical aspect of, of leadership. And, and I see leadership in six distinct phases, but the decisive point that determines if a leader is successful or not is phase three, strengthening relationships. And, and yes. if you can strengthen relationships, then you can forge tight emotional bonds but at the the glue of that is building trust trust okay. is required when you go through challenging times you have to believe that the men and women to your left and to your right are going to make the right decisions at the mm -hmm. right time in the right frame of mind when it matters and if you don't have that trust then you can't work for someone and Correct. i think it's true regardless of military or civilian leadership that's right. How would you provide, I know that's an area that you focus on re relational versus transactional, but what are some tips that you could give people that are in leadership roles right now to try to be more relational? To spend time, to, to take time to have um, conversations. I mean, instead of coming, starting that day off when you walk into the office or, mm. or walk, uh, I know you're military, walk on the field or wherever <laughs> you are. Yeah. Um, you know, of course, if it's war, you can't do that. But before you get to that point, to just have that, that those few minutes to, um, to, to connect. Mm. So connecting with the individuals, you know, ask about the family, you know, ask how, how, you know, how was your morning? How was your weekend? How was your evening? I mean, just little simple things and then just do things to um, show um, that, that you are concerned about the individual. And that's how you connect with um, people. You don't just see them in that position. You have to see the individual and, I um, don't know if, if um, you recall that I'm also an educator. I'm not, you know, actively teaching in the classroom now, but I believe once an educator, always an educator, because there's always teaching points in life. Um, but when I was in the classroom, I would stand at that door every morning and greet my students as they entered. And based on the energy that entered that classroom 
because I, I had established those relationships. I got to know them. I was like that mother there in the classroom. But based on the energy that entered that classroom, determined how I started that day. Mm -hmm. I may have had an intended outcome, you know, a lesson plan. But if the right energy did not enter that room, if I felt that, you know, something that they were carrying, something that um, that was going to interfere with that lesson, you know, me connecting with them with that lesson, then we didn't start that lesson. We may have had a life lesson. I, oh, um, yeah, I, I always had, you know, a journaling. I'm, I'm a big believer in journaling, writing out your thoughts. So based on what they wrote on that paper, I would, you know, would give them maybe a five, 10 minutes for them to just write their thoughts down, what they're going through and based on, and they would have to bring it up to me. And based on what was written on that paper would determine how I decided to interact with them. And the most important thing to me was to make that connection, to show them that they were, that they're important. So although we may not see ourselves outside of the classroom in the different positions, professional positions that we're in, but you're always a teacher. Mm. You, as a leader, you have to be a teacher, but not only do you have to be a teacher, you have to learn to be a student. And that's something that I would train teachers. You can't teach until the student shows up. So that means you have to be willing to learn from those individuals that's in front of you, be it students, be it your employees, before you can teach them. So the student has to always be present. You have to always be a, a learner in order to be a great leader. I love that. There's a, a saying that I've developed kind of over the years. I don't know who I heard it from, but in order to be a great leader, you have to learn to be a great follower first. And because it all, it all starts from mm -hmm. that and you have That's to right. be okay with whatever environment that you're in. Maybe Correct. you have to be the shepherd for individuals and kind of help them through life problems. And I love how you talk about kind of setting the condition of every morning you have a different feel for individuals mm -hmm. on your team. And then mm -hmm. you pursue, yeah, you had an agenda, but we trained a standard, not the time. Just because I said I was going to do something today, maybe something else is being drawn my attention. And we have to kind of go through that. And it's funny you said in the military, like walking on the parade field. And, and I, first thing that popped in my mind is reading the autobiography, I believe, of uh, General Douglas MacArthur when I was going through that award through the military. And some of he was one of the most charismatic leaders people just absolutely loved him but why he would be willing to put himself in Hardin's way to kind of build those authentic relationships with soldiers and i remember in world war ii they just landed on some island uh, that was occupied by japan and there was sniper fire this five-star general which has only happened in a handful of times gets off a boat and walks on the um on this um beach getting mm -hmm. his feet wet, all that stuff, and goes around and starts talking to soldiers that are returning fire right now. And that's all you need to know about why he was able to build those types of relationships of where millions of people would follow him because of who he was mm -hmm. and how much he genuinely cared for, for people. That's right. And then one thing, another thought just came to mind that I also um, would do, um, and especially as a leader, not just um, a, an educator in the classroom, but supervising, you know, 20, 30, 50 plus people, I had to recognize that no one is a carbon copy, mm. that I cannot approach everyone in the same manner. So I learned to, um, and I don't like using the word categorize, but that was what I had to do once I learned the individuals on my team. And then I had different categories that they were placed in that determined how I would approach them. I had those individuals that I would say no maintenance, where they they came in, they had that they they saw the big picture, they understood, we connected right away, we were like minded, so bare minimum to nothing. Once they got their task, you know, I still would create that relationship so they could see I didn't want to take anyone for granted. But I didn't have to put much energy into 
leading and guiding them. So they were my no maintenance individuals. Then I had that low maintenance where, you know, I had to do a little more stroking. I had to spend a mm. little more time, give a little more attention. And then there were those high maintenance um, maintenance individuals where, yeah, the, the energy, it was just redirecting, you know, constant correcting, uh, not correcting, constant connections until, you know, sometimes, okay, they would get it and they would have a great day. But then I had to come back the next day and then start all over yeah. again. And then there, there were those individuals who brought something to the table. They were great team members, but still they were just off the chart. You had to, but I recognize that there's a purpose for everyone. Just because I had to every day, like hold their hand, didn't mean that they deserve to be terminated. There were times where I had to, you know, move them around or give a different assignment. For example, I hired a, a young lady when I was a director slash principal at a private school. She was hired as my van driver for my severely emotional disturbed students. But she was just too passive, too sweet. You know, that sweet personality and those students of that, um, that with that type of behavior, they needed some sternness. Mm. And the person that was in my front office as the receptionist, oh my God, she was just rough. <laughs> you know, just too rough, didn't have, you know, sometimes scare parents off, scare. So I'm like, I need her on that band. And I can use that. And so I, I changed their roles. I brought, bought the van, the van driver. She became my receptionist and the receptionist became the van driver for those students. Mm. So although they were high maintenance in the positions that they were in, I recognized what seemed to be a weakness on that van. That that was a strength for my front office. So that was what I meant by seeing that, you know, a seemingly weakness can be a strength in another area. You remind me of uh, a, a pretty, <laughs> for me, um, a horrible memory that I had of kind of going through a squad live fire at Fort Benning. And it was horrible just because of the time of the year. It was August in uh, Georgia for, uh, for uh, more now it used to be Fort Benning. So it was just super, super hot. Uh, I think it was 110 degrees and we just got done doing several live fire iterations and each one, we never fully completed it successfully. So we had to keep getting, we call recocked, uh, going back mm -hmm. and doing it again and doing it again and doing it again. And it got to the point of where, you know, I thought I was failing as the leader because I was a squad leader mm -hmm. and we had to stay overnight. Every other platoon, every other squad was complete. They were going home, getting to sleep in their beds, except us. And I'm sitting there that night and I'll never forget my squad leader. If he ever listens to this, um, Sergeant first class caveat, he pulled me aside and is like, Josh, you, you have all the right tools, but are the people in those positions, the right people underneath you to be successful? Mm -hmm. And it never dawned on me. All I needed to do is maybe move some people around within my squad right. to be better. And I did that the next day flew right through and everyone was like, Hey, this was one of the better live fires. And you could always chalk it up. Yeah, we, we did it several more times than everyone, mm -hmm. but really what it was, was moving people who weren't necessarily strong in those positions and shuffling them around to people who we thought could be successful. And we mm -hmm. just got exponential results much, much faster, but I, I would love to kind of turn it over to where did your leadership journey start? To tell you the truth, I did not recognize the leader in me. It was others that recognized the, mm. the leadership abilities in me. I um, left the public school system due to I have a passion for teaching and um, believing that everyone can learn. I don't believe that um, individuals can't learn. So I clashed with the public school system. So I walked away from there and ended up in the private sector. And I started as a teacher. And within a month's time, I had the principal slash director at that time coming into my classroom. And when I saw that, you know, I was getting upset. Okay, well, why are you in my classroom? I'm not sending students out. I'm teaching my students. Any behavior students, you're not have to, you don't have to deal with them. I'm doing what you hired me to do. 
And he showed up again the next day and then the third time. And that third time he showed up in my classroom, he asked me to come by his office. Um, and long story short, he was offering me to go to another campus as acting director because they were having to um, release the, the current director. And I'm like, I don't have any leadership abilities, leadership skills. He was like, no, I've watched you and you have what it takes. You can do it. So that was uh, one instance there. And I can tell, you know, several other stories where I was pulled. I was hired for one thing, but then I was pulled to be in another area. And I worked in admissions at Florida Atlantic University here in Florida and Boca. Um, there within a couple of months was pulled into a totally different area in that admissions office because of something that individuals saw in me. So I was really um, taken out of my element, taken out of my comfort zone because I've never cared to be a leader. I never cared to be out front. You know, just give me that position in the background, give me my babies or give me you know, something that I can do where there's no attention, no one is interrupting me and allow me to work my magic. And that was something that I always just preferred to do. But others saw those leadership abilities in me. So after that, I recognized, okay, I do have something and I can do that. So that just inspired me even more to um, teach and to encourage and, and um, coach and mentor others to let them see that you're capable, that, mm -hmm. that you know, sometimes you may not recognize your greatness, but others can see it. So go ahead and, and be willing to step outside of the box to, to walk outside of your comfort zone and, and push yourself to the max. All right, team, let's take a quick break from this podcast. And I want to personally invite you to our private Facebook community that I call Purposeful Accountable Leaders or PALS. And PALS is a community dedicated to inspiring and developing servant leaders by sharing transformational stories and skills, exactly what Tales of Leadership is all about. My goal is to build a community of like-minded leaders that can share lessons learned, ask questions, and celebrate wins when it happens. And my mission in life is clear. I will end toxic leadership by sharing transformational stories and skills, and you will find countless transformational leaders in this group, many of them I have had the honor to serve with in the military. If you want to find a community that can help you grow both personally and professionally, we would love to have you. You can simply search Purposeful Accountable Leaders on Facebook or click the Leadership Resources tab in the show notes to join. I am looking forward to seeing you guys and continuing to grow together on our leadership journey. Back to the podcast. Great leaders have the ability to find other great leaders. And mm -hmm. I always talk about the ability to, to stretch is that someone is going to give you same same as the the quote you know from the bible that we just spoke about from corinthians is that great leaders give subordinate leaders the ability to go beyond their comfort zone stretch their abilities but they make sure mm -hmm. that they don't have enough to where they're going to fail Correct. and i think in doing that you continue to grow and yes. that is exactly why you were chosen for those positions because how you just defined it. I didn't want to be in front. I didn't want to have the mm -hmm. spotlight. You have that servant heart and they saw that. And that's exactly who needs to be in those leadership positions. From my experience, those are the best leaders because they don't have an agenda that is me, 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 me. It's Correct. you, 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 you. Going back to the thing that we started about at the beginning is how can I add value to the team and how can I add value to you? You talked about another thing that I love and I have a rule. It's called the rule of refraction. Great leaders have the ability to bend light off of them back mm -hmm. to their team and right. the ones who actually do the work. Um, and there's a, there's a time where we have to stand in front but that's far and few between that's only in those truly decisive moments where, you know, life or death or big ticket items, every other time that your team should be in front of you and you should be bending the light on them, giving that's them right. the credit. Mm -hmm. And so often they're called, cause I, I can um, think back when I was a college student and it was during the time when um, UNCF would do the telethons mm. and I was over a team 
of um, workers. And this important person, you know, said to me, um, Cheryl, you know, I want you to make sure, you know, come up with some idea that how we can, you know, honor the little people this time. I want the little people to be um, recognized. And before I knew it, and that's one thing I've always been out, not always, but once I you know, got to a certain degree, I became very outspoken. So I'm like, excuse me, I think who you're calling the little people are really the big people, the important people, because if it were not for those individuals, none of you would be where you are and you wouldn't be able to stand out on that stage and do what you're doing. So they're really the big people. And she kind of looked at me like, so, and that's where we have to recognize we could not be as leaders if it were not for our team members, because we can't do it. Um, we can't do it by ourselves. And I, I have this saying where I'd, I'd say that no one has it all together, but together we can have it all. So mm -hmm. although I may stand out front and have the title as a leader, I can't be successful without that team doing their part. So I have to recognize that and shine the light on them to help them to be great and even become greater. And it doesn't matter if they supersede me. I think, who was it? Was it Henry Ford? That where he knew. It, I mean, it was his team. He had the money <laughs> to do, but he knew to surround himself with great individuals to in, in order to build the 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 masterpiece to build the 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 um the greatness and the wealth that he did with all of his creations because he recognized he needed great people and he needed to shine and invest in them in order to be successful and that's what we have to recognize as leaders you know we're not the we're not the great ones we're just those those servants um helping others be great in order for us to get the credit, because in the end, we're the ones that get all the accolades, the credit. So it's up important that we give it, play it forward to those individuals that made us great. That was something that I've always kind of went through in life. And that, that's a very powerful point is build other leaders so well in your organization that you're no longer required because that, that's what great organizations and teams can do is they have the ability to develop junior leaders within their organization because that is the only way to grow sustainably and if you can do that then it goes back to what we talked about before of building deep levels of trust having transparency being able to have be a thriving organization and mm -hmm. i love that no one has it all together but, but together, together we can have can it all have mm -hmm. that that kind of knowing you knowing your story i think you 12 years cancer free 12 and yeah august 16th will be 13 years mm -hmm. going from that because i can only imagine how tough that was but how, how did that change you and the person you are today that has that mindset of thriving, not surviving, but thriving. Thriving. Um, and one of the things that it, it, there were many um, different um, lessons going through that journey, but one of the imp most important things I think that it helped me to do, and, and I sold that into those um, individuals that I'm leading to help them, and that is self love and self care. So, I wasn't recognizing that I was just constantly 24 seven, just constantly going, constantly doing. And I was failing to put in that person of care. You know, although I may have been doing great things and other individuals saw, you know, that greatness in me, but eventually I was going to wear out because I wasn't refueling. I wasn't taking that time to, 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 um, you know, re, re, regroup, to refresh, to relax. I wasn't taking that personal Sabbath. So cancer, it was almost like, um, and I look at it and I think I shared this um, when we first met on one of the um, shows that we were on, yeah. is that, 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 Mer that Mary and that Martha, um, when they were sitting there, you know, with Jesus and Martha was complaining about Mary 
sitting at the feet of Jesus, feeling that she was mm. doing nothing. You know, she's busy cooking. She's busy, Martha, you know, cleaning, cooking, just constantly moving around. And Mary was there sitting at the feet of Jesus. But Martha failed to recognize Mary was doing something very important because by sitting there in that quiet place, sitting there, um, I can say receiving more, we can look at it as um, knowledge, um, meditating, uh, relaxing, refreshing the mind, um, gaining uh, more insight that was equipping her to be a better Mary. And Martha was just busy worrying about the wrong stuff and just trying to do rush and do everything to where if she would have taken the time to be quiet, to be still, then she would have recognized what Mary was doing was very important and she needed to do the same. So um, going through that cancer journey, it taught me the importance of being quiet, being mm -hmm. still, being able to take that break, being able to also help and recognize that my team members also needed that personal care time. So I had to recognize that if I could not leave my position, leave that job, leave that business for a day, a week, or even a month, that means that I have failed as a leader. Yep. That you have you should have been such a great leader with building your team that you could walk away and not be concerned and know that that job is was still going to be done, that the task well, they, you know, each task was going to be completed. So that helped me recognize that, you know, I, I couldn't do it all, that I needed to take that time to to met me time. And if there was an issue with me taking me time, that means that I needed to reevaluate myself as a leader. So I was going to say, boom, podcast <laughs> episode over. There, there's a quote. I, I love Aristotle. Um, but knowing yeah. yourself is the beginning of, of all wisdom yes. and kind of going through that cancer experience, which is, I would say probably scary and deeply humbling yeah. at the same time. Yeah. But really it prioritizes you. It's like being mm -hmm. at war and being shot at for the first time. Mm -hmm. It, it centers you to what's truly important in life. All of these other distractions that we have that we thought were important, that's seem right. to just fade away and we become tunnel visioned on it's like when ever say that my life flashed before my eyes it's mm -hmm. not the car that you had or the house that you had or the food that you ate it's the memories that you had with the people Correct. that you love most the, memories you the, created. the mm -hmm. things that you've created uh, with the memories of the ones that you love and i think it, there's a an acronym that i've kind of set up it goes around the whole concept of a, a short halt in the military because everything that I see through leadership is through the military, but it's stop, stop, take a tactical pause, observe your surroundings, and then pursue with purpose. And I think too often in today's society, people want to just keep going and keep going and keep going right. and keep going. And they don't take that time to journal, have self-reflection, and then mm -hmm. it just leads to burnout. You'll wonder why the, the quiet quitting is happening. The quiet quitting is happening because no one's taking the time to make sure that the team is being looked after. The leaders are just going and going and going in this like hustle culture. And really it leads, it just leads to burnout. And I love how you had the awareness too, is that it's not just me as the leader that needs time off. It is the team that needs time off too. Yeah. And then you just hit the nail on the head with, if I, do I have the confidence, ask this question to any leader who's listening, do I have the confidence to step away from my team right now? and know that the mission is still going to be achieved. And if the answer is no, then you have a lot of serious thinking, I think that you have to That's reflect right. on. That's right. And so and through that journey, one of the, um, I have acronyms also, and <laughs> one of the initiatives that I do through Real Hope for Help is teaching individuals to always fly. I was gonna and ask that you that. Fly, yeah, that fly is to first love yourself. And, you know, and I had to recognize with that, you can't, how can you give out and pour out 
that which you don't already have within. Mm. So we truly can't love other individuals. We truly can't appreciate um, other individuals unless we first start with self. Mm. So, you know, I had to make sure that I was focusing on that self-love and showing um, that love for myself in order for it to pour out. Because if I love myself, then I'm going to recognize just like the important things for me, that there are those important things for the other individuals too. So you have to, it all starts at home. We, we, we have to look within and make sure that, you know, everything that we know that we desire and that we want in life, then we have to make sure that those other individuals are getting it and they want it too. I mean, that they're getting, they recognize that they need, have those same needs, uh, 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 you know, and desires also. But it's hard for a person to do that if they're liking that love, if they're liking that self-care. I, again, going back to the classroom, I had one of my teachers to tell me she wished she could be like me. I understand how you do so well with the students and with the employees because you have a genuine love for all people. And I looked at her, I said, wow, now I understand your problem and why you're having an issue in the classroom with your students. Because if you don't understand why I can genuinely love people, and if that's something that you're not doing, then you're in the wrong place. You know, you shouldn't be in the classroom. And she looked like, say, I'm, I don't mean to be harsh, but <laughs> you can't. Uh, you know, those individuals, before you can teach them, they have to know you care. Yeah. So if you don't have a genuine care, love, or whatever word you want to use, then, then you've taken up the wrong position. You know, mm -hmm. you don't need to be there because that's something that you have to, you have to love. And you have to love yourself first and appreciate yourself first in order for that to exude out to others. It's it's so true. And I think um, Brianna Greenspan, she always talks about filling up your cup before you can fill up others' cup. And I, I like to think of it as, as a battery. We, we are a battery. And mm -hmm. how do we charge our batteries? We charge ourselves. And then we go throughout the world, throughout the day, and we add energy to our teams. We add energy to our family. We add energy to the organization. But at the end of the day, we're still depleted and we can't go back and provide that same amount of effort if we have not recharged our batteries. So you have to you have to find what recharge your batteries. And I think I know something of yours and it's called dragon boating. And I need to know yes. more about what that is. <laughs> okay, and what dragon boating is, it is a sport that a Canadian doctor can't recall his name right now, but for individuals who have gone through cancer, hmm. if you are aware, a lot of it, there's a lot of probing and, 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 and intrusion upon your upper body muscles when, you know, even if you have just some tumors removed and many of us have, you know, one breast or have a double mastectomy like I did um, due to my family history. But dragon boating is a safe sport. It was discovered that that's one of the safest sports, if not the only safe sports that um, survivors, and I like thrivers, cancer thrivers, breast cancer thrivers can do um, with learning the proper techniques to keep, rebuild their upper body strength. And really, if you get in that boat, which is an oversized canoe, it really strengthens you. It's a full um, body workout. Because what um, we do and my team here in Jacksonville is um, the Mama Glams, which, you know, took away the gram <laughs> to make you, yeah. you know, glam. we are glamorous. So the Mama Glams, we are a team of 20 plus um, courageous women, a couple of men, more than 20, but it's 20 in a boat. And they're left hand paddlers and then they're right hand paddlers. And we are there working in sync together. And that's another way with teamwork. Mm. We have on one accord. One person can't outdo the other. We have to trust that individual behind us, in front of us, and on the side of us. And we're out there. We're paddling um, for our life. We're competing against other um, 
courageous survivors out there, some calm waters, rough waters. And our um, saying with that is that we won the battle. Now let's paddle. I love so that. You, so we're, we're out there and we compete all over the world. I wasn't able to make it this year, but they just came, went to eight in April, they went to New Zealand. Mm. Um, and we do every four years, just like the Olympics, where um, now uh, another country, countries are going to be bidding and submitting mm. their proposal to in the next four years to host our next four year um, competition. Four years before this, 2018, it was in, but COVID messed up, messed up the dates. But in 2018, it was in um, Florence, Italy. And I was fortunate enough to travel with the team to Florence, Italy. So again, there were over 4,000 women. Each country was represented. And we, for four days, we were out there in the water and we were cheering each other on. I mean, it is just, it, it is amazing to witness. And there are even some women who are out there in those boats that are still battling cancer. But that keeps them, that gives them hope to be out there with other sisters. So that is to, to and I never really thought about it, teamwork. There was no way we could be successful if we were not willing to work as a team and recognize that no one has it all together, but together in that boat working on one accord, you know, on, on, on stride and, and, um, uh, and coordinating with each other. You know, we couldn't outshine each other. So we had to do it together in order to, to win. So it, it's a beautiful thing. I love that metaphor uh, of rowing because it's so true. If you have someone who, if you got, if you have a Josh <laughs> on, on your boat that just goes after it, because I remember like young young Josh, if you would put me in a boat with the uh, twenty other people, I would have like, hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna show everyone up. I'm gonna paddle as hard as I can, <laughs> and then we're just gonna do circles, and you're not gonna go anywhere. and not recognize yeah. you're not gonna get in, you're not going anywhere, you know, because you're gonna be you know fighting against just you in that water, beating that water, because if you're not paddling in sync, yeah, together, then we're not gonna go anywhere. I love that. That is probably one of the best metaphors in leadership because there's so many different lessons to pull from. But I think at the end of the day, teamwork, if yes. wherever you are, whatever you're doing, whatever problem you have, you can't do it alone. You have to have a team. So find the right mm -hmm. team and learn how to row and get on sync with, with mm -hmm. everyone. I got to ask what drove you to leave your career and work for a nonprofit and kind of get into that mental health and uh, wellness space. It's because I recognize that in that, um, in the education um, arena that they were just focused. They had that one agenda mm. that is to, there's a lesson plan, there are standards, there are different um, standardized tests. They were just driving, pushing that agenda, pushing that agenda, you know, have the students in school, the first, um, if the students were in school, those first 10 to 12 days so they could get the FTE, the full-time enrollment count. That means those schools got their money from the state, from the government. And then they didn't care whether or not those students actually learned or whether or not they were in the classroom. As long as we kept them in the classroom for those days each semester so they could get that pay, get that check. And it wasn't about educating students. It wasn't about um, teaching and developing the whole person. So I could no longer, the paycheck wasn't important to me to where I, I, I saw my sons. I saw my grandson mm. and I know what my demands were for them and are for, for them. So whatever demands I had for my sons and my grandson now from those educators, I put out the same thing and gave the same thing that I expected for my children. But I was hindered because um, there were oftentimes when I pushed for my students, it went against the rules and regulations that the schools and the principal of the administration had in place. Mm. So I could not truly be a teacher. 
I could not truly be an educator and stand firm to what my core beliefs were and stay in that classroom. So with leaving, walking away from the job, not allowing myself to be driven by that paycheck and walking out on faith and establishing my organization, Real Hope for Help, has given me the opportunity to go back into those schools and do it my way so I could truly make sure that, and I know that they still have to have the right mindset, but if I'm pouring into them and showing them that I care, and if I'm getting to learn them and and find out what's troubling them and show them ways to overcome, how they can cope, how they can overcome and be a success and thrive in life, then that's what I wanted to do. And that's what I'm doing. And it, uh, I think it is, who is it? Um, is it Wes Brown? I think, uh, was it um, Dr. Monroe, Miles Monroe? One of them stated that you should, whatever you do, the work that you do, you should love it so much that you would be willing to do it and still put in the same passion and, and, and the energy, even if you didn't get a paycheck. Yeah. And that's where I am with that. I'm that same energy that I was putting in in that classroom, putting in as a um, principal, um, director, a leader with those teachers and then educating those students. I'm able to do that without being hindered, because in that my last assignment in the public school system, I was told by my principal that I was an island to myself because mm-hmm. I put my students first. I didn't just pay attention to the rules and the regulations. And then in the private sector, in the private school, the CEO of the company that um, owned like 100 schools throughout the United States, I was working for them. His uh, motto to us whenever we would have our annual meetings was keep warm butts and seats by any mm-hmm. means necessary. It was nothing about truly educating and developing well-rounded individuals to go out into society. So that is what drove me to establish my organization to deal with, um, because I always wanted the students that no one else wanted. So, and to teach them that you can thrive, you can survive, you can overcome. And I do that through journaling, helping them to write out their thoughts, helping them to write their feelings down, meditation because you know i would teach my students you have to have a clear mind you have to be focused in order to learn and i know the importance of meditation in order to help you you know reach that state and then i also know the importance of the arts be it drawing um, music um, any form of the arts is uh, another way to stay balanced and to keep you focused so those are three elements that i use um, with my students, with adults. I work with rape victims. I work with veterans also. I work with um, anyone that has experienced any type of trauma mm. to help them overcome and be a better them through journaling, meditation, and the arts. And teaching self love through that process. All right, team, let's take a quick break from this episode. And I want to share a leadership resource with you. And that is the Resiliency Based Leadership Program. RBLP's vision is to create a worldwide community of practice committed to building and leading resilient teams. So why do you need to build and lead a resilient team? Resilient teams are the key to individual and organizational growth, regardless of being in the military or in the civilian workforce. Building collective teams allows for exponential growth and the team's ability to overcome adversity, adapt, and most importantly, grow. And then bottom line up front, resilient teams are just stronger together. And here's a fact. 99% of the people who take that course recommend it to others. And I'm one of them. I just completed my certification and I highly recommend this. And the great news is it's most likely free to you. And if you're in the military, it is a hundred percent free to you. And if you want to learn more, you can look in the show notes for this episode and find the link and use the discount code J M C M I L L I O N. And that is also in the show notes. 
back to the episode. There's a so so there's three quotes I think it really summed up everything that you just said, but I'm I'm gonna go with with two of them. And the one is another one from Aristotle is educating the mind without educating the heart is no education at all. No education. That's right. And I cannot imagine I want my son and daughter taught by Cheryl. I don't Mm -hmm. want my son and daughter to be taught and developed by people who want to have warm butts and seats because their heart is not aligned correctly. And to me, it almost infuriates me that there are people in education space that are willing to gamble on the future of society like that. Uh, Because I mean, that is that that is the future that is the next generation that's going to come up. And Mm -hmm. you said something else too. And I had um, one of the guests on the episode, Jason Van Camp say this, and it just stuck with me. The purpose of life is to find your gift the meaning of life is to give it away. And That's right. that to me, my purpose is, is leadership. I want to teach people how to be a better leader because I don't want them to go through the same struggles that I had to go through and the loss that I had to experience. That's and I'm right. willing to give it away for free right? because right. I want to and make if a change. Let me share another um, far-fetched way that I would train um, teachers and I still speak to um, teach individuals um, still to this day. I would share with my teachers and other leaders because there are some traumatic things that have happened in the workforce where you've had individuals come in and shoot up and all that, sadly. Mm -hmm. Um, But I would let them know because someone asked, why do you do what you do? Why do you give, pour in so much? And I, you know, I let them know, you know, I think about that student that so many individuals have given up on and if I continue to do what I'm doing and then one evening or one day, because, you know, a gun and, and a sick mind has no, you know, time frame as to whether they do it morning, night or noon to go out and okay. do something, bring harm. But if so happen, I'm at that ATM machine and all of a sudden a gun is pointed to my head. And if I turn and make contact with that individual And that individual will see that, oh, it's Miss Lawson Wright. She tried to help me and walk away. Mm. I say, you never know what could trigger the mind. So I want to make sure, because I know I'm not going to, I wasn't going to be able to save every student, but at least I was going to give 100%. I was going to pour out everything within me, within my power to do that. And just so happened You never know if you could stop because of your behavior and your attitude, you're showing that you value that person and you tried your best, could save your life. And I actually had a student to come to me four years, four or five years after I taught him in middle school, out one balance time even having dinner. And he came up to me and Miss Lawson Wright, and it's like, he's like, you don't know me? And I was like, I think you have to be a student because my students are the only ones who would call me by my full last name. And he, you know, called his name and said who he, who he was. And I'm like, oh, wow, look at you. And he was like, I wanted to thank you. I graduated because of you. I'm like, baby, I had you seventh, eighth grade. So how did you graduate because of me? He said, you never gave up on me. Hmm. That you only teacher that I ever had that never said a negative thing. He said, and I know I was bad. I was terrible in your classroom. He's like, my mother even gave up on me. Hmm. He was like, well, when I got to that ninth grade, at the end of ninth grade, I think he said he had to repeat ninth grade, but he was said at that time, I wanted to you know, succeed. He said, all of those words, all of those positive things that you used to say to me started to kick in. And I heard those. By that time, I was a, a, a water ball. <laughs> I'm yeah. just. Crying. But he let me know that he was a success because I did not give up on him in middle school. Had a wife, had a baby, and he actually they had started their own business. And he said all these years he wanted to thank me. That's amazing. So pouring out is not in vain. It may seem like you're not making a difference. 
but you know, you never, you, and we may never see the end results of our great leadership, but we have to still have that faith and believe that it's going to be a positive outcome, whether we mm -hmm. see it, you know, some things are tangible right away. And then there are going to be some things that may not, you know, bloom or blossom until years later. So we don't give up because it, it may, it seems like we're not having a positive effect. We have to believe in our purpose and, and why we are doing what we are doing and continue to pour out, to be empty. And that's something that, um, that's Miles Monroe. I want to die empty, knowing mm. that I've served my purpose. This is exactly why I wanted to share Lawson Wright on the <laughs> Tales of Leadership podcast because of just the powerful stories you have. And that really summed up to me is are you planted or are you buried? The frame of mind. If you're buried, everything seems to be on top of your shoulders and just no way to move forward. But if you're planted, all the struggles you have right now, the issues you're going through, the turmoil that you're going through is for a reason. And That's one right. day you're going to be able to break through and see that light if you continue mm -hmm. to go. And that that is such a powerful and inspiring story. That young man finding you and then sharing that story and i guarantee you I, I can only imagine you know how emotional that that yeah. was but kind of getting to where you are right now what inspired you to write your book that you just wrote jewels of my uh, was it jewels, jewels of, of my, my journey. journey um and quite a few of those writings came actually came from my many years of journaling and what inspired me to write it and because I wanted to share it with the multitudes. I wanted to um, help again, encourage and, and show individuals that there's power in writing it down. And then you may think that you don't have, can't have an impact on the lives of others, but you never know when someone else is reading your story or hearing your story or hearing inspiring words from you how you can help someone else blossom. And like you say, um, bloom right where you are. You may be in a desert right now, but reading Jewels of My Journey can help you recognize that, you know, you may not see the water, but in the only water that may be there it are, are tears that's falling from your eyes, but those tears are still water and they can still nurture you and help you bloom and overcome, wait for that desert or for that storm to pass. So mm -hmm. that is my, that's the purpose of Jewels of My Journey to help individuals see that regardless of what the journey looks like, that there are jewels there. And, and it's up to us to write them down and hopefully inspire someone else through our story. If you can find, th that is one of the, the secrets to life that you know, unfortunately I, I've just learned but if you can find gratitude in some of your worst memories, that is where most of the true wisdom in life is found. If Correct. you can be grateful in some of your worst memories, then that is what is truly inspirational. Uh, and that kind of goes to, you know, David Braun, I think he has the quote is that be grateful and have faith. Mm -hmm. he's grateful in some of the most traumatic experiences that he had. And he had faith that he was going to see it through, but it could be applied to anything. And I, I love the title of that uh, jewels of my journey, finding jewels throughout mm -hmm. the journey and tying it all back to journaling and being able to write it down on paper because yeah. I shared this on the last episode, but it's true. I call it T-ball. Our thoughts shape our beliefs, our beliefs, drive mm -hmm. our action, our actions define our legacy and how we think writing it down, it gets it on paper and you would be amazed. I would show you all the notebooks that I have just mm -hmm. written, just random notes. But what has come out of me is inspiring to me. I didn't even know that I had that inside of Correct. me. And That's right. We all have it inside of us, but we mm -hmm. have to slow down and we have to be intentional and just and be intentional and take that time. Even if you just start with a couple of minutes a day and just writing a, a, a thought that you may think is meaningless. Yeah. But once you go back and, and read it and reflect over, you can see that there is actually a message that's going to help you do something better 
uh, help you, you know, that, you know, maybe you need to rethink or take a different direction. So those written words, there, there's power there. So it's very important for us to write them down so we can go back and reflect mm-hmm. over them. And then you can add to, you may be inspired. Okay, well, there's another piece I need to add here. And that's how you develop. And I, I believe that's how many writers you know, started. I, I I don't know, you know, what God has planned for me. I have about four other books that I know that that's in me that I've actually started, but whether or not I'm going to be that author um, of several books, bestsellers, I'm claiming it. I don't know, but I'm, um, I'm going to continue to write them down because I know it's for a purpose. Mm. So what other projects are you currently working on right now? And could you kind of walk through your nonprofit, Real Hope for Help? Like I said, I work with veterans. Today I was at, we have a mission here that house veterans. So today I was there meeting with the um, leader of the um, organization there with the veterans to set up a time where I will go in with them and help them, you know, give out, I have journals, I, I give those to any individuals that I provide the service to, they don't have to pay for any of the supplies or any of the mm-hmm. services. So I will share um, part of my story. I have a veteran that's on my board, who will also go and he will share his story and share how writing and journaling helped him to overcome and thrive. And we will have sessions, um, with those veterans, some that may want to get um, like prompts to help them get to put their thoughts on paper. And then even to help those other ones that understand that just freelance and just whatever, you know, there's no method to it. There's no right or wrong, but just put your thoughts on paper. You know, who, who, you know, what made you mad, you know, doing basic training. Was there something that you disagreed with or was that something where you you wanted to go off on someone, you know, did you um, have to cry sometime, you know, whatever those thoughts are, are, you know, did you make it a career or why did you get out? What triggered, you know, where you are? Do you feel that you can do more than what you're doing? So different prompts to help them overcome and understand that there's nothing wrong with putting those words on paper, even if it brings tears to your eyes that there's more room outside than there is inside Mm. and we go through a thing with the release through with the organization where we use the um dissolvable paper after we go through a session of meditating and, and thinking of something that we know that we need that's been holding us down that that has us bound you think of those things be it one thing or you know, a hundred things, but you're going to be at a place to where if you don't feel that you can release everything after that day's session, but the thing that you know that you can release and that's going to help you move to the next level, you're going to write that thing or those things on that paper. And then there's this bowl with this spoon where when you're ready to um, release it, you may decide to do it instantly, or it may take you later that day. Or, you know, sometimes I'll leave the the, um, the bowl, the equipment there, and they will come back later that night or they, you know, the next day. But whenever they're ready to release, put that paper in that water and stir it and it's going to dissolve. And at that time when you release it, you're willing not to pick it back up, even mm-hmm. if it's something that you can't change. Um, but you've been carrying it because I, I, I share with them um if you can't change it, don't carry it. Mm. So don't pick it. You know, you may not be able to do anything about it right now, or you may not be able to do anything about it at all. So why carry it? Why allow it to hinder you from being that person that you know you were created to be? Mm. So that's that's um, one of the many things that we do with um, the organization we um, help with food. You know, if, if uh, uh, there's a single mom that's struggling, we will go to the different pantries and, and get food or, or we will give money, uh, uh, take someone to um, the grocery store, take individuals to um, doctor's appointments. I work also with the cancer survivors. We have a, um, 
care package that we give to them, the journal. We give out the socks. We give out the scarves for their heads. What else? I'm trying to think. The pins, um, little crafts. So it's, it's just anything, any way that I know that I can help put a smile or help individuals to recognize that they are important and that they have purpose. That is the purpose of Real Hope for Help and what we do. I, I, I love that. And one of the things close to my heart is, is veterans and helping them work through some of those issues. And that, that's really where all of this started for me. Mm-hmm. It tells the leadership, leadership, leadership. And I kept going back to how can I impact 1 million veteran lives in 10 years? How right. can I do that? I can do that by helping develop better leaders and having mm-hmm. them lead soldiers better. Right. That's how I do it. And I love how you're doing it. And I love your heart, like just how big it is. And it's not, it knows no bounds. It's not just one area. It's every area, anyone, equity, diversity. It doesn't matter your background. I am here to help you. And I'm here most importantly to serve you. It's time for our final show segment that I like to call the killer bees. These are the same four questions that I ask every guest on the tales of leadership podcast. Be brief, be brilliant, be present, and be gone. Question one. So what do you believe separates a good leader from an extraordinary leader? Recognizing that they, although they may have all of their degrees and their titles, but they can still learn. Mm. That they are not beyond learning and learning from someone under them. So second question. What is one resource you can recommend to our listeners? Be open, transparent. And the way we do that is to journal, right? Yeah, journal, every day journal so you can go back and, and self-reflect to see how you can do something better the next time. Over 75 episodes recorded, no one has said journaling is a resource and it just dawned on me that that is the most important resource that we have. Uh, yeah. uh, I love that. Okay. Yeah. So question three, if you could go back in time and give your younger self a piece of advice, what would it be? Never allow um, what you think your limits are to be a limit. Hmm. Be willing to step outside of, the, of that comfort zone. Or never put limits on yourself. Never put limits on yourself. So last question, how can our listeners find you? And then more importantly, how can they add value to you or your mission? They can find me on Facebook, all of the social media outlets. Um, I do have a personal page, Cheryl Lawson Wright. But then the organization is Real Hope for Help on Facebook, um, Instagram, Twitter. You have all of the social outlets. The email is realhopeforhelp at gmail.com. Website is realhopeforhelp.com. And they can reach out to me there. They can help. Um, they can purchase a book because all proceeds from the book goes toward there's no profit for me. All of the proceeds go to support the services of the organization. And if they would like to donate it as a nonprofit, so any donations would be tax exempt. Um, so they can feel free to um, donate. And if they're at a corporation like say Bank of America, which I have an individual who you know raised funds there, they do matching grants. So anyone that if you're making donations, you report it, you know, let me know. I can go on to that site and let them know that this donation was made. And then that organization, that corporation will match that donation. Wow. So what I do, um, like I say, I don't get paid. Um, so, and it does anything great that we do. There's a cost yeah. um, because we, we don't charge any of the individuals, the recipients, anything. So it, it does take funds. It does take grant. If there's someone out there that's a grant writer that would like to donate services, that's something because there are many grants out there that can benefit what we do. Cheryl, 
this has been an amazing episode and i'll be honest with you when i filmed this i was i was concerned that i was wasn't going to be able to give you my full attention because i had several things happen today and i had another podcast that i had to film but this has been by far i think one of the most inspiring episodes that i've ever filmed and helping me kind of re kindle the heart, the drive that I have just hearing yours. And I always talk about that. I try to find people that come on here that share the same core values and the beliefs that I have is that there is a better way to lead regardless of what you're doing. And there's people, transformational leaders, what I like to call purposeful accountable leaders out there that are doing it and they're doing it right. And you are one of them. And I'm glad to know you and I'm glad to have you in my life. This has been an amazing episode. Thank you so much for this opportunity, Josh. And it has been a pleasure. I mean, from day one, I think we connected and I've always enjoyed um, communing with you. Um, and tonight was no different. So thank you for this opportunity to share. Yeah. Have a great night. All right, team. That was another amazing episode with another amazing guest. I like to call it a purposeful, accountable leader. Cheryl is a purposeful accountable leader. And I think you got a taste of what I already knew was there And her heart is just so big of how she helps freely with everything. And I think it really summed up when she wrote the book, Jewels of My Journey, and is getting absolutely no profit from it. It goes straight to her nonprofit organization. And if that doesn't tell you everything you need to know about Cheryl, then I don't know what will. But what are the top three takeaways that you should have from this episode? And I'll be honest, as always, it was hard for me to narrow it down. You may have different ones. I'd love to hear what you have. But for me, I wrote down the three that stuck. The first one is fly. If you want to be a fly leader, it's funny because I'm great with acronyms and I believe Cheryl is too. Talk about being a rad leader, being a pro leader. Well, now we have being a fly leader. First, love yourself. And we talked about this in the show is the concept of a battery. You have to charge yourself before you can go out into the world into a day, give energy to your family, give energy to your team, give energy to the problems you're going to be facing, give energy to the organization. You have to figure out a way to charge yourself first. And if you can't do that, then you're not going to be able to lead sustainably and one of the rules that I have, be able to lead with the rule of 100%. Give each day 100% of your effort. Maybe today won't be exactly equal to yesterday, and that's okay. But the concept of you being able to give 120% today because you only win 80% tomorrow is mathematically impossible. And if you do that, you're only going to lead to burnout. So how do you prevent it? Figure out ways to recharge yourself, be a fly leader, love yourself first. Number two is rowing. I love this concept in this metaphor. It's never going to come out of my head, but what is the concept of rowing? It is a group of individuals that are synchronized so closely that they are all working towards the shared vision and a common end state, common goals, a common mission. They're rowing together. If one person on that team has an ego and tries to show other people up, they will ruin the entire experience for everyone. So rowing is one of the best metaphors of teamwork that I've ever heard of and ever thought of and credit to Cheryl for coming up with that. And the last one that I had, and this one was hard for me to kind of narrow it down, but it's being planted versus being buried. And it's how you see yourself. You can have a big purpose. You can have a big why, and you can be doing all the right things. But if you view yourself as just being buried of more stuff being piled on you, more stuff being piled on you, you're eventually going to hit trace or burnout, what we talked about before. But you need to rethink the problem of where you are right now. You are not buried. You are planted. You are there for a reason. Those things are happening for a reason. You're never given more than you can handle. One day, 
you are going to grow because you're growing right now. We grow in discomfort. We are stretched in discomfort. We become better leaders in turmoil. You will grow and you will reach the sunlight. You are planted. You are not buried. Hey guys, if you've gotten any value from this episode, do me a favor. Subscribe, share this episode, write a review, go to mcmillionleadershipcoaching.com, read one of my blog articles and leave me a comment. Let me know if the content that I am creating for you is adding value. Hit me up on social media, follow me on Instagram. And another great thing that you can do is support this channel. I do everything for free. I have an amazing podcast editor, but I do it because just like Cheryl, I'm trying to add value to you guys, to this world, to become a better leader and show you there is another way to lead where it's not going to result in just burnout and stepping on people all the time, all the way up to the top. There's another way. There's a better way. You could be a purposeful, accountable leader. As always, I'm your host, Josh McMillian, saying every day is a gift. Don't waste yours. I'll see you next time.